All right, guys, this is the uh, much requested practice lab exam for anatomy and physiology one for the integumentary system and the skeletal system. Um, and just kind of as a caveat, there are a lot of practice questions on here. There are like 90 practice questions on here, but this isn't necessarily everything that you could have on your exam. Um, the skeletal system especially has so many structures for you guys to learn. So make sure you're studying your, your notes and your lab manual because there, there are other structures that you need to know as well. This is just a practice, um, just to kind of get you in the groove, to see how the questions are going to be asked, etc. cetera. Um, also, this is from an online anatomy and physiology course. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. If you're seeing it in person, you're gonna have the actual bone in front of you as opposed to a picture of the bone. Um, <clears throat> however, if you can do it from a picture, you should definitely be able to do it from the real bone because that's much easier when you have the bone in front of you. Okay, identify the bone highlighted in green. So this is obviously we're looking at the skull and this bone right here that's highlighted in green is the bone that formed the upper jaw. Remember the upper jaw is the maxilla. The maxilla. The two jaw bones both start with an M, so don't get them confused. Maxilla is the top, mandible is the bottom. I remember that because max, right, like the max is like the highest. So the maxilla is the top one. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Identify the bone highlighted in green. So now instead of the upper jaw, we're looking at the lower jaw, which is the mandible. the mandible. Identify the bone. This is the bone at the back of the skull. Remember the bone at the back of the skull is the occipital bone. Okay, the occipital bone. That region was occipital, right? So if you remember the regions, you remember a lot of the bones, like the frontal region, temporal region, occipital region. Those are named for the bones that are underneath. Identify the bone. Um, this is that cheekbone right here, which remember is the zygomatic bone. Okay. Zygomatic. Um, so this, I really like this picture, the way that the bone gets highlighted because you can see the full bone and you can see the way that it, it crosses behind the eyes. Um, if the way you probably were used to memorizing this was looking at the side of the skull and you see like the temporal bone, the temporal bone, and then like right in front of it, you would see this little bone right here. Um, and that's the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone. It's just one single bone. It's, I think students sometimes think that there's two because you see it on this side and then you see it on this side as well, but it's the same bone. That one single bone is kind of like a butterfly shape and the wings kind of are on the side and then it goes in towards the center as it goes back behind the eyes. So the sphenoid bone. Uh, <clears throat> so the sphenoid bone, which we just looked at was back here, right? This is talking about the next bone that forms the, the medial aspect of the orbit, um, <clears throat> just like inside the eye, and that's the ethmoid bone. Ethmoid bone, this green one right here. There is another really tiny bone that's right in front of that. Um, so if this was just a little tiny area highlighted right there, just in front of it, that would have been the lacrimal bone. Okay, so the ethmoid's a little bit bigger towards the back, and then right in front of it is the lacrimal bone. Um, <clears throat> identify the bone feature at the tip of the arrow. So this is something to keep in mind, you guys. Pay attention to the question. If this question just said identify the bone, you would have to tell me the name of the bone, which this is the ulna but this is saying the bone feature. So the specific part of the bone that's right there. Um, so really the first thing you need to do though is, is figure out what bone it is. 
And again, that's harder when you're not in person because I can't tell how big this is. If it was in person, I would see that it's, you know, about the size for my arm right here, and that would help me. So you've got to figure out some other feature of the bone that's going to help you figure out what it is. This is easy because it's the ulna and it happens to have a U at the very top, right? If you look right here, there's a nice U for ulna. Um, but this isn't asking me for the bone, it's asking me for the feature. At the top of the ulna right here, um, that U, you'll see that there's like the two processes, right? There's this part that sticks up there and the part that sticks up here. And then in the middle of the two, there's that notch that's hollowed out. This is asking me for that notch. That little notch or that depression is called the trochlear notch. The reason it's called the trochlear notch is because it fits on the trochlea. Uh, remember that the trochlea is the, the little end part of the humerus and this sits right on top of it. So like if this was the trochlea, the trochlear notch sits just on top of it like that. And then it just rotates like this when you open and close your arm. Identify the bone at the tip of the arrow. Notice again, I said be specific. Um, I, I took the time to say be specific. So that means something, right? Um, in that case, it means to make sure you number the bone. Um, we're looking at the hand. And when we look at the hand, remember we have all of our carpal bones right here, right? The wrist bones, the carpal bones. Um, and then um, we have the metacarpal bones, right? Carpals are in the wrist. Metacarpals are these ones that are enclosed in the hand. So like all of these are the metacarpals. And then the finger bones are the phalanges, right? Remember for each of the fingers, besides the thumb, you have three phalanges, right? The proximal phalanx. If we're talking about just one, it's called phalanx. If you're talking about many, you say phalanges. So you have the proximal phalanx, the middle phalanx, and the distal phalanx, right? One, two, three. The thumb is different though. The thumb only has two phalanges, right? If you look at the thumb, there's one, two. So there's no middle phalanx. So if you were looking at the thumb in general, just kind of counting off the bones, because the reason I point this out specifically is that people get confused. People think that it's one, two, three phalanges. It is not. Right? If you're looking at the bones and counting these off, the first one that you have on the thumb is um, the first, right? Because it's numbered one, the first metacarpal. Then you have the first proximal phalanx. Then the first distal phalanx. Right, so this bone right here is the proximal phalanx, and then again, we number it one. That's what I meant by be specific, give me the number. The numbers are one, two, three, four, five, right, starting at the thumb. So the answer here is the first proximal phalanx. Don't get that wrong. A lot of people would answer this saying it's the first middle phalanx. It's not, okay? Identify the bone feature at the tip of the red arrow. Um, again, this says bone feature. So first off, looking at this, we're looking at the sternum, right? There's the three parts of the sternum, the manubrium, body, and xiphoid process. This is talking about the specific feature right here. Um, that happens to be an angle that like protrudes outward right there. Um, that angle is referred to as the sternal angle. The sternal angle. And that is a very important um, bone feature. We use that a lot medically. It allows us to start counting where the ribs are. Um, because you can't palpate the first rib. The first rib goes underneath the uh, clavicle and you can't palpate it, you can't feel it. So if you're trying to count down the ribs, which we do when we're trying to locate the heart, you, you count down on the ribs, um, you can use the sternal angle and the sternal angle will bring you over to the second costal cartilage um, where the second rib is and then you can count, you can feel and palpate down and count the ribs from there. So the sternal angle is a really important um, a really important feature for you to know medically.
identify the bone at the tip of the arrow. Um, these bones are all the tarsal bones, right? The bones of the ankle. The two largest ones you see here, those two largest ones, um, you guys should be able to name pretty easily. This top one here that we're talking about in this question is the talus. The talus. This is the one that forms the joint with um, the bones of your leg, right? Like your tibia. Um, this under here, this he large heel bone, is the calcaneus. That's why the heel, we refer to that region as calcaneal. Calcaneal goes with calcaneus. So the heel one, if I asked for that, would be calcaneus. This question, specifically this top bone, is the talus. Identify the bone feature, circled in red. Um, looking at this, you should know that this is one of the vertebrae. Um, specifically, it's one of the cervical vertebrae. Um, I know that it's cervical because it has these little holes right here on the side, right? These transverse foramina, um, or transverse foramen for one of them. Um, and this is a really special, a very special vertebrae, right? This one looks different than all of the others because of the specific feature that's sticking up. Um, this happens to be C2, the second cervical vertebrae. Um, and this specific feature that's sticking up like that is called the dens. The dens. Um, this is important. This, this, um, it's called the axis, this bone itself. If I asked you for the name, you would say the axis. Um, but this, the dens of the axis sticks up like that, and it goes between um, or through C1, the first cervical vertebra. And this is what allows you to turn your head like this, right? C1 like rotates on the dens like that, and you can shake your head no. Identify the bone feature in the red circle. Okay, so this bone that we're looking at is the humerus, right? The bone in the upper arm, the humerus. Um, I can tell that because of the way that the top of it looks. Um, both the humerus and the femur have these like nice rounded circle, circular heads like that. But the humerus is much smaller. Um, when we looked at the femur, it would like, it'll like thin out and then have this really big circle like that. So you can tell the difference between the two because of that. If you're taking a lab practical in person, it'll be really easy to tell the difference because the humerus is you know, this long, the femur is like way longer. So this is the humerus. Um, and this is asking for one of these processes that's down at the bottom of the humerus. Remember that the humerus, right down here at the elbow, the humerus meets up with two bones. It meets up with the radius on the thumb side and it meets up with the ulna on the pinky side. So there are two processes down here at the bottom of the humerus, one process to link up with the radius, one process to link up with the ulna. Um, this right here, this process that it's pointing to is specifically shaped kind of like that. And it's kind of the larger of the two processes. The other process that's down here is this one right here that's more rounded. So the one that this is pointing to, right, the kind of the kind of larger process that's more medial, right? It's more towards towards the inside right here where the, the arm attaches. That is the, the process that meets up with the ulna. Um, and that process is specifically called the trochlea. The trochlea. If I were pointing to this one over here. This other one is called the capitulum. Okay, the capitulum is more rounded, right? You see how it's more rounded, whereas the trochlea has this little divot in the middle, right? Where it kind of goes up and then out again like that. It goes like that. Um, that's the trochlea, okay, the trochlea. Also, you can tell because the trochlea is in towards the, the medial aspect. It's in towards like the inside of the arm. Um, and you might ask, how do I know that that is medial versus lateral? The way that I know that is because this is where the head of the humerus is. That big rounded part, remember, that's what forms the shoulder socket. So that's where it attaches to the arm, whereas this other side is the outside. So the medial aspect or inside of the arm is here on this side. And then the outside is the other side. 
and I can tell too like where the radius attaches and where the ulna attaches because remember this is the anatomical position with the hands like this right and the thumb is on the side of the radius which would attach to the capitulum the pinky is on the side of the ulna which comes up and attaches to the troclea remember we looked at the ulna and I called that notch the trochlear notch so the trochlear notch is where the ulna that you comes and hooks up onto this trochlea. Identify the bone feature at the tip of the red arrow. Um, <clears throat> so I'm looking at a pelvis. Um, specifically, I'm looking at a female pelvis. I know that by looking at this angle right here, if this was a male pelvis, that angle would be much sharper like that. Um, but I'm looking at a female pelvis. That doesn't matter for this question. They both have these features. On the sides of the pelvis, there are these deep depressions, right? These deep cups right here. And if you just think about it logically, right, that's like right here on the pelvis. Well, what happens right there, right? Your leg attaches. So that's where the hip joint is formed. That's where the femur is going to attach. The head of the femur is going to go into that depression right there. Um, that depression right there is called the acetabulum. The acetabulum. Don't get it confused with these actual holes. These holes right here, that, that hole would be referred to as the obturator foramen, right? Foramen, foramen is a hole. So obturator foramen is the hole but this is pointing to just the depression that forms the hip joint, the acetabulum. Identify the bone feature circled. So this is talking about a specific part of the mandible, right? The lower jaw remember is the mandible. So this is a very specific part of the mandible, specifically this part of the mandible that rises up, that goes up to form a joint. Um, this part of the mandible is called the ramus. Identify the bone. Um, so this is the triangular shaped bone that's at the bottom of the spinal column. Right, you have all of your vertebrae, right? your cervical vertebrae, then your thoracic vertebrae, then your lumbar vertebrae, and then this. This is the bone um, at the very, um, towards the bottom. It's also the bone that forms the back of the pelvis. Right? We just saw the hip bones curving around, and this is at the back of the pelvis. This is the sacrum. Um, when the baby is developing, these are actually separate bones. There are separate sacral vertebrae, just like there are separate lumbar vertebrae. Um, but they all fuse together. So this is what you see, like see these lines? This is where they were separate vertebrae that all fused together. Just interesting. Identify the bone feature. Again, pay attention. The last question just wanted you to say sacrum. This is asking for this specific bone feature. These little holes, right? There are all of these little holes that are present in the sacrum. These are where the sacral nerves, like the spinal nerves, come out um, to, you know, come out and come through here. They pass through here to go into the pelvis. Um, <clears throat> a hole, remember, is a foramen. So this is a sacral foramen. Um, there are numerous of them. So your lab manual probably says sacral foramina. sacral foramina, or you could just say sacral foramen. Again, bone feature. We're still looking at the sacrum. Um, we're looking at the front of the sacrum, right, or the anterior aspect of the sacrum. I know that because this area is like this nice smooth area. If we were looking at the back, there would be these spikes pointing out. Remember, the back of it has a sacral crest those little like spikes um, <clears throat> this doesn't this is smooth so I know I'm looking at the front of the sacrum now on the front of the sacrum there's this like protruding edge right here right this like point that curves towards the front um, and that's called the promontory
the promontory. The promontory is really important um, in obstetrics when we look at uh, like a pregnant woman. And the reason for that is that this promontory, this part that sticks out, it, it kind of makes the pelvis smaller, right? If you can think about the hip bones coming around like this in the front, the distance between the promontory and then in the front, the um, like where the pelvic bones come together at the pubic symphysis, that distance, that space is the space that the baby has to fit through. Um, so we do look at the promontory when we're looking at um, a baby in the, in the mother's womb. Identify the bone feature. Um, this is the femur, right? Remember I said that the humerus of the arm and the femur of the thigh or the leg both have rounded tops. Um, but I told you the femur was like much more obvious, right? So it gets really like thin right here at the neck of the femur. And then the head is really, really round. Um, <clears throat> if you were in class in person, this is going to be obvious because it's huge. It's like the longest bone in the body. So that's the bone that goes right here in your thigh. Um, so the top is where we form the hip. And then down here, this is where you form your knee joint, right? Where the femur is going to meet up with the tibia underneath. This is asking for the bone feature, specifically this, this smooth part right here on the front of the femur. That's where your kneecap sits, right? Your kneecap or your patella sits right there on that surface. So that surface is called the patellar surface. The patellar surface. Identify the bone feature. This is the tibia the tibia, one of the major bones in the lower leg. So the tibia, the top of the tibia appears where we have the knee joint. So we would see like the femur, the bottom of the femur goes like that right there, and that forms the knee joint. This is the bottom of the tibia down here that it's pointing to. And this is pointing to this little notch that sticks down at the bottom of the tibia. Just to kind of get your bearings, you guys, like the first thing I would always do is get my bearings to think about, you know, what bone am I looking at? What part of the bone is it? Where in the body is this, etc. So this is the bottom of the tibia where we would form the ankle joint, right? Like the, the talus would be right here and then, you know, your foot comes down. So this is looking at that little bone that's on the side of your ankle. And if you look at your ankle, you have these little bulges, right, that stick out on either sides of your ankle. Um, these bulges are there from little bone processes. You have one on the inside of your ankle and one on the outside of your ankle. Um, the one on the inside of your ankle is from your tibia, right? This process right here that this is pointing to, this is the process that forms that, that um, inside bulge on your ankle. It's called the medial malleolus. The medial malleolus. The bulge on the outside of your ankle is the lateral malleolus, and that's a part of the fibula. Um, the way that you can keep medial and lateral straight is just the bones themselves, right? The um, tibia is medial. The tibia is on the inside of the leg. The fibula is the lateral. It's on the outside of the leg. The way I keep that straight is fibula lateral tibia doesn't have an L in it, right? So fibula lateral, tibia is medial. Oh, the tibia itself too, it's kind of like a T, right? If you noticed like how, how it was a lot wider at the top and then it gets like thinner as it goes down. So think like a T for tibia. Um, identify, identify the bone feature at the tip of the red arrow. So um, this is, I've also highlighted it in green so you can kind of see the way that it's curving in. This is a really tiny little feature um, inside the nasal cavity, right? You can see you're looking like inside the nasal cavity. And you'll notice that on the walls of the nasal cavity, there are these little bones, these bony shelves that curl out like this. 
um, on either side of the nasal cavity. We'll talk about those more in ANP2 when we do the respiratory system. Um, but these are called the nasal conche or nasal like conch, like a conch shell because they curve like a conch shell does. Um, but you have three sets, the superior, middle, and inferior. This is the bottom, right, or the inferior most one that this is talking about. So this is the inferior nasal conche. Um, right above that, this is the nasal bone, right? So if I were pointing right here, that would be the nasal bone, the bridge of the nose. And then remember, right in the middle, this really like narrow, narrow sheath that comes up right there is the vomer. So the vomer, the nasal bone, and then inside you have the nasal um, conchi or concha. Conchi is the way that it's really pronounced. It's pronounced conchi, but I'm, I'm telling you conch, conch, like a conch shell. Identify the bone feature at the tip of the red arrow. So this is pointing to this specific process that's right here on the top of the mandible, right? This is the mandible, the lower jawbone, and the mandible has two processes on the top of it. Um, there's this little hook-like process that goes up towards the front, and then there's the rounded process right here in the back. Um, um, the front little like hook-like process right here, Oops, right here, that doesn't attach to anything. It doesn't form a joint. Um, it's just for muscle attachment. That is the um, coronoid process, the coronoid process. But this is asking about the one in the back, right? This one in the back right here. This is a rounded condoil, right? These like, uh, we have condoils a lot and we'll see them in all different parts of the body. But this is a, um, a condyle is just a rounded process that forms a joint. So there'll be like a little depression in one bone and then a rounded condyle in another bone and they'll fit together like this to form a joint. Um, so this is the, you could call it the condylar process, um, but to be specific that it's on the mandible, it is the mandibular condyle. the mandibular condyle. Oop, speaking of, so this is just pointing to this hook-like process that's here in the front of the mandible. And we just said that that was the coronoid process. The coronoid process. Um, identify the structure at the tip of the blue arrow. Uh, we've mostly been talking about the skeletal system this whole time, um, but remember the exam is also on the integumentary system. Um, there's much more skeletal, but there is some integumentary system as well, so it's kind of changing gears a little bit right now. Um, but identify the structure at the tip of the blue arrow. So this is pointing to this muscle. This is pointing to the muscle that's present right here. Um, and you can see that that muscle is attaching to the hair follicles, attaching to the, the root or the bottom of the, um, the hair. Um, that's the muscle that when it contracts, it makes the hair stand up on end and gives you goosebumps. Um, specifically, that is the erector pili muscle. Erector pili muscle. Um, identify the bone feature circled in red. Again, the hole, so don't get confused. You're looking at the side of the skull and you're looking at this hole right here. If you think about what's right there, that's where your ear is. So that's the hole, right, that goes into your ear where sound is allowed to enter into the, the uh, middle ear. Um, that's called the external acoustic meatus. 
Okay, acoustic like sound, right? External because it's connecting to the outside at the outside. So external acoustic meatus. Identify the bone. Um, this is the radius. The radius, which is um, the bone on the thumb side of the forearm. The way that I know that is because of what the top of it looks like. Remember the top of the radius is like this perfect flat circle, right? So like if you were to look down on it, it would just be a perfect circle, right? So I can see that it's this perfect rounded edge of it. That's telling me it's the radius. Identify the bone feature. Um, when we look at the side of the skull, um, the temporal bone, has uh, a couple kind of obvious features that stick out. There's this really big rounded meaty process and then there's also a really pointy process right next to it and you had to know both of those. This is asking you about this really rounded process and that's the mastoid. Mastoid process. Um, again, there's two that you have to know there. One is bit really big and round, one is really pointy. I keep them, keep track of them. The mastoid process is massive, right? It's this really big round one right back here where muscles attach. Mastoid process, massive. The really, really thin pointy one is the styloid process. Styloid, like a stylus, right? Really pointy like a stylus. Okay, so on this slide, we're looking at the bottom of the skull. Right, you can see like the bottom of the jaw right here. Um, you can see this is the occipital bone in the back here. So we're looking like just like the skull has been tipped upside down. This is a really big hole right here. Um, there are multiple little holes like foramen and passageways that you guys need to know. Um, but this is a really large one, a really big one. Um, this is where the spinal cord goes through and meets up with the brainstem. Um, the name of this hole is the foramen magnum. Hey, okay, the foramen magnum. You know that a foramen is a hole. Magnum is like, again, big, right? Like massive. It's the big one. Um, foramen magnum. Um, identify the suture indicated by the red arrow. Um, the sutures are these like these squiggly lines that you see where the skull bones come together. The skull is not one bone, right? You guys learned the different bones, the frontal bone, parietal bones, occipital bone. Um, <clears throat> and when you're little, these bones aren't yet, they're not yet connected to each other. That's why the, the baby skull is flexible. Why sometimes like a baby can be born with a cone head, right? Like a little misshapen head because their skull bones get kind of squished a little bit and moved around as they're trying to squeeze through the birth canal. But as we grow, um, eventually our skull bones end up fusing together and at these little joints where they fuse together, that's called sutures. Um, <clears throat> you guys had to know four sutures. On the side of the head here was the squamous suture. Um, and then the three going from the back front towards the back of the head. Um, and the front is the coronal suture. Then the sagittal suture goes down the middle of your head right here. And then this in the back of the skull is the lambdoid suture. So lambdoid, lamb. Doid. I think the lambdoid suture. The way I remember that again is um, from the front to the back, I drank a Corona, then I sat down, then I laid down. Um, so coronal, sagittal, lambdoid. Oop, there we go. Identify the suture. So this is the one that's going down the middle of the head. That is the sagittal suture. Identify the bone. So <clears throat> um, what you're looking at here again is like the bottom of the skull, right? So you can see the jawbone here, the back, you know, the occipital bone, and you're looking up at the roof of the mouth, right? The roof of the mouth right here. There's actually two bones there forming the roof of the mouth. The front part here is still just part of the, um, the maxilla, right? So kind of like the maxilla forms the upper jaw. If you just pinch the maxilla, 
right? You're feeling the top of your mouth right there. So the front part of that is just the maxilla. If you proceed back a little bit from the maxilla, then you have another bone that this is pointing to right here, which is the palatine bone. Okay, the palatine bone, which makes sense. You call that your palate, right? Like your hard palate and your soft palate, that's the palatine bone. Um, before, when we were looking at the nasal cavity and I showed you the nasal conchi, um, or concha, we, um, I told you guys that it, going up the middle of the nasal cavity, that really thin bone was the vomer. You can also see the vomer from this side. This like really narrow bone right there that sticks up, that's the vomer. But right now we're talking about the palatine bone. Identify the bone feature. Um, so again, we're looking at the skull. Um, I can see the jaw bone in the front, right? This is the occipital bone in the back. We already looked at the big hole right here, the foramen magnum, right? Where the, the spinal cord goes up and meets the brainstem. So this is talking about these nice rounded processes on either side of the foramen magnum. Okay. Again, they're part of the occipital bone. We said the back of the skull is the occipital bone. These are rounded processes on the occipital bone. So they are the occipital condyles. Okay. Occipital condyle. Identify the structure. Um, so again, back to the integumentary system. This is one of the glands of the integumentary system. There are lots of different glands, right? Glands that make oil, glands that make sweat, etc. This happens to be a gland that makes oil, right? You can see that it's associated with the hair. Right? There's the hair coming down and the follicle surrounds it. And this is the gland that's associated with the hair follicle. Um, you guys know that if you don't wash your hair for a couple days, it gets oily, right? This is the gland that makes that oil. Um, it's a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous gland. Um, the, this right here is also showing you a sebaceous gland. It's just that it's been cut so you can kind of see inside it. But either one, I could be pointing over here or to this one and they're both sebaceous glands. Identify the bone feature. Um, so this is the scapula, right? The scapula or what you would call like your shoulder blade. Um, <clears throat> and the scapula is where we form the shoulder joint. So right here where this is pointing, this is the, the depression where the head of the humerus would fit to form the shoulder. Right, so the humerus would kind of sit like this, forming the shoulder. Um, this depression, whoops, this depression right here is called the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity. I identify the bone feature. So again, we're looking at the pelvis, right? You can see the sacrum in the back. You can see the oscoxa or the hip bones that come around the sides. This is talking about the specific feature. So this, um, this ridge that's present right here. When we look at the hip bones, there are actually three separate bones that fuse together on each side, the ilium, ischium, and pubis, right? So like up here is the ilium, down here is the ischium, and then in the front is the pubis. So that's part of the ilium, right? It's this crest, right, this large ridge. So we call that the iliac crest. That's the part of your hip bone that you can feel, right? Like you feel your hip bone sticking out, you're feeling the iliac crust. Uh, identify the feature. So you guys, again, we're looking at the bottom of the skull. You know that right here is the foramen magnum, right? The large hole is the foramen magnum. And then I had you guys, there are four other holes that you guys need to know counting forward from the foramen magnum. And it kind of rhymes. Right, the first one was the jugular foramen and then the carotid canal. So jugular foramen, carotid canal, foramen lacerum, foramen ovale. 
they're really hard to see in pictures. In the actual lab, it's so much easier to, to point to them and count them out. So I would only ask you like pretty much this one because it's right by the, the, the foramen magnum. Um, but the first one here is the jugular foramen. Hey, the jugular foramen. Um, you can kind of, if you move up from that, you can see the carotid canal right there. Um, the foramen lacerum actually is kind of easy to see as well. Now that I think about it, those, those three aren't bad. Foramen ovale is, is kind of difficult. Identify the feature, the ridge at the tip of the red arrow. So this one, you guys were looking into the skull. Hey, you can see the, um, the parietal bones have been removed. So you're looking down, with, you take out the parietal bones, the brain is gone and we're looking like into the base of the skull here where the brain would be sitting. So this is like underneath the brain. Um, there are a few features that you guys needed to know here, not too many, um, but remember like the cella tersica was right here. In the front we have on the sides this kind of like flat area on the sides here, that's referring to the cribriform plate and then the little holes in there are the cribriform foramina. And this is actually pointing to the ridge in the middle of the, that. So the cribriform plate is flat and then it comes up like this to form this, this ridge that sticks up. Um, and the ridge that, that pokes up like that is the crista galli. The crista galli. Identify the bone feature. So we're looking at the femur, right? Again, you know that because it's got this like thin neck and then this really rounded head. Um, and we're looking at the bottom of the femur. So this is the part of the femur where it forms a joint with the knee. We happen to be looking at the back of it. I know that because there's this really deep depression right here. Um, remember the front had that nice smooth patellar surface, um, but it doesn't really matter. I just, the reason I'm looking at the back is because you can kind of see more of this. Um, but the bottom of the femur here where it forms a joint at the knee where it forms a joint with the tibia, there are these two really rounded um, processes, these two really rounded condyles, right? Remember the rounded process where it forms a, a joint is a condyle. So there are, there's a, a condyle on the medial side and on the lateral side. So on the femur, there's the medial condyle and the lateral condyle. So you just have to figure out what side this is. Is this medial or is this lateral? This is medial. Um, I know that because that's where the, the head of the femur is. Just think about it logically, right? So the femur is right here in the, in the thigh, in the leg, and it attaches at the hip right here. So the head of the femur is where it's going in to form your hip. Um, so that's on the inside, right? And then it goes down like this. So that's the inside of the leg. And then the outside is, is over here. So wherever the head is, that's the medial aspect. So that makes this the medial condyle. If I were pointing to the other side, that would be the lateral condyle. Identify this part of the spine in the red circle. Um, <clears throat> remember there are multiple segments in the spine, right? There's cervical region, then the thoracic region, then the lumbar region, and then at the bottom is the sacrum. So this is the lower back, which is the lumbar region, right? Or these are the lumbar vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> you might also have to name the curves. I just said identify the part, so lumbar is fine. But if I said identify this curve, then you would have to say lumbar lordosis. Remember that there are two curves that are lordoses. So there's the cervical lordosis that curves in like this and the lumbar lordosis that curves in. The parts of the spine that, cape, that go outward like that um, are kyphoses. So there's a thoracic kyphosis and a sacral kyphosis. Okay. Identify the type of vertebra. 
this is a cervical vertebrae, cervical vertebra. Um, and the cervical vertebrae, even if you're not in person, if you're in person, it's easy to identify them because they're really small, right? They get bigger as they go down. The lumbar vertebrae are really large. Um, but it doesn't matter, even if it's just a picture, it's really easy to identify the cervical vertebrae because they have these extra holes on the side. The other vertebrae don't have those. Those are only present in the cervical vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> they're there for the, the vertebral artery. There's a vertebral artery that passes up the neck and goes through those. Um, and it's not present in other parts of the spine, so you don't need those in other parts of the spine. Oops, speaking of, identify the bone feature. Hey, that specifically is pointing to this transverse. Foramen, transverse foramen. Transverse is on the side, right? It's in these, like, these are the transverse processes. So this whole thing is a transverse process. And then that little hole that's in there is the transverse foramen. Identify the bone feature. Um, we're looking at another one of the vertebrae. Um, this specifically is a thoracic vertebrae. Um, I know that because it looks like a giraffe, right? Like when you look at it, you can see like the horns and the ears um, and this long snout. That is a thoracic vertebra. Um, <clears throat> the, the vertebrae, no matter what kind it is, they all have the same processes sticking off. There's the spinous process that goes towards the back. There's the transverse processes at the sides. And then there's articular processes on the top and on the bottom. Um, these are the articular processes on the top, right? So that's referred to as the superior articular process. Um, identify this part of the spine. This is the middle region of the spine. Um, this is the thoracic region thoracic, um, <clears throat> and then up here again would be cervical. Identify the bone feature. Um, this is the large hole that's in the center of the vertebrae. This is another one of the vertebrae. This is specifically one of the lumbar vertebrae, um, but this is the large foramen or large hole that's in the middle. So this is just the vertebral foramen. Hey, vertebral foramen. Notice how there's not little holes on the sides here, right? There's no transverse foramen here. So this is not cervical. Um, this is one of the lumbar vertebrae. It has a really big beefy body right here. And notice the spinous process is kind of short. It's not really long and thin like in the thoracic. So this is one of the lumbar vertebrae. Identify the bone feature in the green circle green so this right here is pointing to this really kind of nice base portion um, this is where all of the vertebrae stack up together so you'll have like this this large base like this and then a disc one of the vertebral discs intervertebral discs and then you'll have the next one and then you'll have another disc and then the next one um, this is the vertebral body Identify the bone feature in the blue circle. Um, so this is, again, pointing to the processes that go towards the sides, and those are the transverse process. Transverse process. Identify the layer at the tip of the blue arrow. So when we're looking at the integumentary system, remember there are large regions, right? So the very top region is the epidermis, and then underneath that's the dermis, and then the bottom where you have all this yellow fat is the hypodermis. This is talking for about a specific layer of the epidermis. Um, the epidermis has four or five layers, depending on the type of skin that we're talking about. This side is showing a thick skin, right? Because it has so much of this, this outer layer. 
Um, this site over here is showing us thin skin, but regardless of whether it's thick skin or thin skin, the outermost layer here, this layer of dead skin cells on the very, very outside, is the stratum corneum. Okay, stratum corneum. Uh, again, this is the skull. This is another one of those pictures where like the top has been removed and we're looking down into the skull. Um, <clears throat> before we had looked at the, uh, remember we saw like the cribriform plate, the crystagalli was like that ridge. This is back behind that a little, it's pointing to this little depression right here. And that little depression is the cella tersica, the cella tersica. Identify the structure. Um, this is pointing to another one of the glands that's present in the skin. Remember over here, the blue one, those were the sebaceous glands, the oil glands. There are also sweat glands, and there are two different types of sweat glands. These little ones, right, these little white ones that you see here are eccrine sweat glands. You could just say eccrine gland. You could say eccrine sweat gland. Um, if you want to be really technical, you could say eccrine sudoriferous gland, um, but this is the eccrine gland. Any of these white ones, right? This is just whole. These other ones have been cut so that you can see them, um, but those are the eccrine glands. Identify the structure at the tip of the red arrow. Um, so this is pointing to the larger sweat gland that you see here. The larger sweat glands are apocrine glands. Um, identify the structure at the tip of the red arrow. So this is pointing to one of the little um, the receptors that are in the dermal papilla. Remember that there's this curvy connection between the dermis and the epidermis. And um, the little parts of the dermis that are protruding up, those little fingers that are going up, those are the dermal papilla. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but there are little tiny sensory receptors um, that are connected to nerves that are up there in those dermal papilla. Um, and those little tiny sensory corpuscles, they have numerous names. Um, you could call this a tactile corpuscle, um, or you could call this a corpuscle of touch. A corpuscle of touch or tactile corpuscles. Um, technically, you could also call this Meissner's corpuscle. Um, Meissner's corpuscle. These are really sensitive little um, tactile receptors that give us information about um, like light touch. All right, um, identify the bone feature at the tip of the red arrow. The bone that we're looking at here is the scapula or the shoulder blade. Um, <clears throat> and there are two processes that hook off the top of the, the shoulder blade. Uh, there's the top one here, and then there's this bottom one. The processes are called the acromion and the coracoid process. The way that you can tell the difference is that the acromion is a continuation of the spine of the scapula. So when you look at the scapula here, this spine, this ridge that goes across the back of the scapula, the spine continues up into this top process, which is the acromion. This one, this bottom process, is the coracoid process. So the answer to this right here would be coracoid process. Identify the structure of the tip of the blue arrow. This is another one of the glands, I'm sorry, not glands. This is another one of the sensory receptors that are present in the skin. Uh, this is the receptor that's a uh, larger receptor that's down deeper into the dermis and even down towards the hypodermis, um, but down really deep in the dermis. The, the small little receptors that are up superficially we saw right here, right? Those were the tactile corpuscles or the corpuscles of touch. 
this is the larger sensory receptor that's down deep, um, and this is a Pacinian, Pacinian corpuscle, or also called lamellar corpuscle. These are the ones that give information on um, deep touch and pressure. Identify this vertebra. Uh, again, it's specific name. This is one of the cervical vertebrae. I know that because it has these transverse foramina, these little holes on the side, um, but this isn't asking me for the type of vertebra. The question says to give me a specific name. There are two of the vertebrae that you guys needed to know the specific name, um, C1 and C2. So the first two cervical vertebrae, and they are the atlas and axis. The axis we looked at earlier, the axis was the one that had that dens that stuck up on it. Um, this is the very first cervical vertebrae, um, the very first of the cervical vertebrae. This is called the atlas. This is the vertebra that the head sits on. Right, so the occipital condyles uh, will sit right there and the head sits right on top of this. I know that this is the atlas because it's the only one of all of the vertebrae that does not have a body right here. Normally there's a vertebral body, right? A nice strong mass that sits right there and then the vertebral foramen. This does not have a body. The reason for that is that the dens from C2 sticks up right there. So where the body would be, there's just this hole for the dens to stick up and then the rest of C2 sits you know, right underneath like that. So this is the atlas. Identify the part of hair at the tip of the arrow. When we look at the hair, the hair has multiple parts. The root of the hair is the part that's under the surface. The bulb is the wide part down here. This is pointing to the part of the hair that extends past the surface of the skin. So all of this out here, the hair you can see and touch and cut and brush and all that fun stuff is the shaft. The shaft. Identify the bone feature. This circle is circling this little hole that's right there. Right? There are multiple um, sets of holes that are present in the face, and these holes are there typically for nerves, so that nerves, the cranial nerves, can pass through the skull bones towards the surface. Um, <clears throat> there are holes right here above the eye, and then there are holes right here underneath the eye. The ones above the eye are the supraorbital foramen, um, orbit refers to the, the eye, right? Like this, this socket right here for the eyes, the orbit. Supra is above. So supraorbital are the holes above the eye. This is pointing to, or this is circling the hole below the orbit. So this is the infraorbital foramen infraorbital because it's below the orbit, foramen because it's a hole. Identify the bone feature. So again, we're looking at the pelvis um, and we're looking at this front right here where the two um, pubic bones come together at the front of the pelvis. So you'll notice there's a pubic bone right here and a pubic bone right here. Um, and then in the middle, there's this cartilage pad. That blue structure is a cartilage pad where the two bones come together. This is called the pubic symphysis. Pubic symphysis. Identify the structure at the tip of the blue arrow. Um, and then in parentheses, the tissue around the hair. You can see around the root of the hair, there's this, this light purple kind of casing that goes around it. And that's pointing to the hair follicle. The hair follicle. Um, you'll notice it's the same color as the, uh, the, the stratum basal of the epithelial layer, right? So like this purple that's in the, um, or sorry, the epidermis, not the epithelial layer. Um, the stratum basal of the epidermis, this kind of purple, 
extends down and goes around the root of the hair and then continues over again. And that forms, again, the hair follicle. Identify the type of vertebra shown. Again, we have cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, and lumbar vertebrae. Cervical, you know because it has the little holes on the sides, the transverse foramina. Um, <clears throat> thoracic vertebrae look like a giraffe. This looks like a giraffe, right? It has a really pointy spinous process. So that makes this a thoracic vertebra. If it was lumbar, this would be a lot like shorter and chunkier. Um, it looks like a moose when you look at the back of a lumbar vertebra. Identify the bone at the tip of the green arrow. So in general, this is the sternum, right? The breastbone that sits right here in the front of the rib cage um, is the sternum. And the sternum is actually three bones. There's a bone up here and then in the middle and then at the bottom. The green arrow, again, pay attention to the question because there's also a red arrow on here. Um, so you have to really pay attention to the details. But the green arrow is pointing to this main part of the sternum here, which is the body. So that is the body of the sternum. This is that thoracic vertebra again, um, and this is just circling the the process that's going out towards the side. So that's the transverse process. Identify the bone feature. We mentioned this earlier, um, but this is talking about this large hole that's in the front of the pelvis. That's the obturator foramen. Obturator foramen. Um, nerves pass through that. So there are a bunch of spinal nerves that come through um, the sacrum here. And then those nerves have to get down to the leg somehow. So many of those nerves will pass through the obturator foramen and then go down into the leg. Identify the layer at the tip of the blue arrow and it tells you specifically the white line. Um, again, from this curvy line up is the epidermis and the epidermis has four or five layers. This is thick skin, um, right? You can see how thick the stratum corneum is, how thick this outer layer is. So this is thick skin. So that means there's gonna be five layers. There's an extra layer that's not present in thin skin. And that extra layer is actually what this is pointing to. If you'll notice this white line here does not continue over into the thin skin. There's this white line here, but there's no white line on the other side. So off the top of your head, you can probably say the stratum lucidum is the layer that's not present in thin skin. You could also count the layers from the bottom to the top to figure out what this is. The stratum basal is the bottom layer. So this like kind of dark purple line on the bottom is the stratum basal. Um, then the stratum spinosum is this lighter purple. Um, then the stratum granulosum is the dark purple line. Then the stratum lucidum is the white line. And then the stratum corneum is on the top. So this is the stratum lucidum. Stratum lucidum. Identify the bone feature. Um, this is the, the collarbone, right, which is the clavicle. So this is the clavicle, the bone that um, goes from the sternum in the front and then it goes to the back and connects to the scapula. Um, <clears throat> the clavicle has two ends to it, the sternal end, which is in the front, and then the acromial end, which is the part that hooks um, or connects to the scapula. Remember when we looked at the scapula, there were those two little processes, those two like hooks that came up on it, and the top of them was called the acromion. So that's why part of the clavicle is called the acromial end, because it attaches to the acromion. When you're looking at the clavicle and you're trying to figure out which side is which, um, the sternal end is really blunt. It's like a rounded part that has this really blunt edge cut off. So this end, right, see how blunt that edge is? It's like thick and round at the end with a blunt edge, is the sternal end. 
that other end over here, this question that is actually asking for is the acromial end. The acromial end looks like it's been pinched, right? It's like if you took the nice round end and you just kind of squeezed it, like if it were clay and you just pinched it off a little bit, it's much more flattened. See how this edge has been squeezed and flattened? That's the acromial end. So the answer to this question would be acromial end. Identify the bone at the tip of the green arrow. Oh, we already did this one, sorry. Um, this bone right here, the top of the um, tarsal bones is the talus. Identify the bone feature in the red circle. So we're looking at the sacrum. We looked at the sacrum a little earlier, but we looked at the front of the sacrum. This is the back of the sacrum, the posterior aspect of the sacrum. And I know that because of this, this ridge that's sticking out here, these, all these little spikes that poke out. That tells me that it's the back of the sacrum. Um, <clears throat> so I'm looking at the sacrum, and at the top of the sacrum, there are these two articular processes, just like in um, the vertebrae. I told you guys that the, the sacrum was originally separate vertebrae, and they just fused together. And just like the other vertebrae, on sticking off the top of the vertebrae, there are superior articular processes. Um, well, as the sacrum fuses together, we still see these superior articular processes on the top of the sacrum. And those are there to articulate with or form a joint with the last of the lumbar vertebrae. So L5, the last of the lumbar vertebrae, sits right here. And it has inferior processes that will stick out and kind of hook in with these. Um, so these are the articular processes. Oops, sorry, I clicked forward too quickly. Um, but I was just saying that those were the articular processes on the sacrum. So this is asking for uh, the layer indicated by the blue bracket. So looking at the skin, remember the top of the skin up here was the epidermis. And then this blue bracket is pointing to the dermis the dermis and then if it were underneath that it would have been the hypodermis identify the bone so again always read the questions if you just tell me what this end of it is that's going to be wrong we already answered that this wants to know what the name of the bone is and this is the clavicle the clavicle or collarbone identify the bone so this is again the sternum um, we did the body of the sternum before. Now this is talking about the very bottom of the sternum here, this little like blade that sticks out. That's the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process. Identify the bone at the tip of the red arrow. Again, tell me what this whole bone is. And this is one of the ribs. Rib. Identify the bone at the tip of the blue arrow. So now we're talking about the very top of the sternum. Um, and the very top of the sternum is the manubrium. Okay, so manubrium, body, xiphoid process. Identify the bone feature. So this is the same rib that we just looked at, but now we want to know what this little point sticking out is called. When we looked at the rib, um, the head of the rib is the very end of the rib, right? That's where it's going to butt up to the thoracic vertebrae in the back. Um, <clears throat> and then it, it curves around, and this little, this little process on the rib right here is going to articulate with or form a joint with the transverse process of the vertebra in the back. So like the, the, the end of it, the head sits right up against the verte the body of the vertebra, and then the rib curves out and, and this um, process articulates with the transverse process of the vertebra. Uh, this little, the answer to this, this little process that sticks out is called the tubercle. The tubercle. Identify the bone. The feet are organized very similar to the hands. So um, all of the ankle bones are the tarsal bones. And then after the tarsal bones, we have metatarsal bones. So there are five metatarsal bones and they're numbered just like in the hands, how the thumb was number one and the pinky was number five. 
same thing in the feet. So um, the big toe is number one. So this would be the first metatarsal. Identify the bone at the tip of the blue arrow. So now we're looking at the pinky and we're looking at the first little bone in the, the pinky toe. So again, we have tarsal bones, then metatarsals, and then the rest are phalanges. So this is the, um, the first of three phalanges in that pinky toe. So that is um, the proximal phalanx, and it's in the pinky, so that's number five, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So it is the fifth proximal phalanx. And that's an NX, okay? P-H-A-L-Y-N-X, for the fifth proximal phalanx. Bone at the tip of the blue arrow. Um, again, this is the heel bone, which the heel bone is the calcaneus. Okay, calcaneus. Identify the bone feature. This is the tibia. Remember we said that the tibia, which is down in like the shin, looks kind of like a T. And when we look at the tibia, there's this roughened patch that's present like right here, which is the tibial tuberosity. Okay, the tibial tuberosity. Identify the bone at the tip of the red arrow. Again, this we said was the tibia. Identify the bone, bone feature at the tip of the red arrow. This is the femur. Um, <clears throat> and the femur has, again, the head and then like this thin neck. And then you'll see these two bulges that stick out. There's this larger bulge that sticks out here and then a smaller one here. Um, sorry, erase that. Um, this is asking about the one at the tip of the red arrow. So that's asking here about the larger of the bulges that's sticking out. So this would be the greater trochanter. Greater, because it's the bigger one, right? So the greater trochanter, and that's for muscle attachment. Identify the feature at the tip of the green arrow. So now we're just talking about the smaller little one over here. And you can you can see it, right? Like if you look at the tip of the green arrow, see how the bone sticks out a little bit right there, how it protrudes right there? Um, this is the smaller of the two, so it's the lesser trochanter. Um, identify the feature at the tip of the blue arrow. So this is still the femur, um, but it's talking about this big rounded end. So that's the head of the femur. This is um, the ulna again. Remember, you know it's the ulna because of the U right there. When we look at the top of the ulna, we said that there was this trochlear notch, right? The notch in the middle. And then there's the process that sticks out on the back and the process that sticks out on the front. This is asking about the process that sticks out on the back. It's kind of a larger, bulkier process that sticks up towards the back of the ulna. And that's the olecranon. The olecranon. Identify the bone feature in the red circle. This bone is the radius. Again, the reason that I know is because of this big like rounded top, the perfectly circled top is the radius. And this is pointing to this pointy edge on the bottom of the radius. Any pointy edge is typically a styloid process. Um, so this is just the styloid process of the radius, or you could say um, the radial styloid process. Identify the bone feature. This is the humerus, the bone in the upper arm. Again, it has this really rounded top. It's not as, as um, obvious as the femur. The femur was really narrow and then round. 
the humerus doesn't have the narrow part. It's just got this, um, the really rounded head. So this is the humerus. When we look at the humerus down towards the bottom of the humerus down here, there's a depression, which we call fossa, in the front and there's one in the back. The depression that's in the front of the humerus is smaller. The one that's in the back is much larger. So looking at this, this is a much larger depression. So this must be the back of the humerus that I'm looking at. And that depression is called the olecranon fossa. That word olecranon probably sounds familiar um, because we just said olecranon was part of the ulna. Remember when you, um, the humerus is right here in the upper arm and then it connects to the ulna at the elbow. And the top of the ulna is a U like this, right? And that fits right onto the humerus. So when you straighten your arm, this top part of the ulna, the olecranon, curves like this up into um, the olecranon fossa. When you bend your arm, it comes out. And then when you straighten your arm, the olecranon goes up into that olecranon fossa. This is the head, right at the tip of the blue arrow is the head of the humerus. Identify the bone. This is your shoulder blade, right? Like what we would generally call your shoulder blade. Um, <clears throat> and the bone itself is technically called the scapula. This is that ridge that goes along the back of the scapula and that's called the spine the spine of the scapula. Identify the bone feature. This is talking about this border or this edge of the scapula. When you look at the scapula, you can identify the lateral border and the medial border or the lateral edge and the medial edge. The way that you can tell which is which is by looking at where the glenoid cavity is. Remember the glenoid cavity right here is where the humerus attaches. That's where the arm attaches, right? It would go down like that. Well, obviously the arm attaches on the, the lateral side. The arm is not attaching in the middle of your back. So um, wherever the glenoid cavity is, that must be the lateral side. And then the other side is medial. So that makes this the medial border okay, or the medial edge. Um, of the scapula. A bone feature, this is the acromion. Remember when we looked at the, the clavicle, right, or the collarbone, I said that it has a sternal um, end and then it has an acromial end. And the acromial end meets up with the scapula, the acromion of the scapula. This is the acromion. So to find the acromion, you just move up the spine. So this is the scapula. The spine of the scapula is this ridge right here. And at the top of it, you have this process, which is the acromion. Sorry, there's that's I-O-N at the end. Acromion, the acromion. The other little process, right? We see these two little like hooks at the front of the scapula. Um, the top one we just looked at was the acromion. This one right here, this other little hook right there, is the coracoid process. This one doesn't meet up with any bones. It doesn't form a joint. It's just there for muscle attachment. Coracoid process. I identify the bone. This is the humerus. Identify the bone feature. So this is pointing to, if you can tell, this little hole that's present here um, in the mandible, in the lower jaw. Remember, we had holes on top of the eye, holes underneath the eye, and now we have holes on the chin. If you remember your regions, remember the chin is called mental, and a hole is foramen or foramen. So this answer is the mental foramen, and that's where the mental nerve passes through. All right, guys, that's it. That was a lot, and that's not nearly all of it. I know there's way more, um, way more structures, but this is at least a really, really good
spaces. Okay, if you're familiar with all this, at least on my exam, you'll get an A, you'll do fine. Um, but this is a, a really a really decent summary of all of the, the skeletal features and the integumentary features. All right, thanks for watching, guys.